All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope the break was useful for you to digest what we've seen in the first, um, in the first uh, part of the lecture. So I hope the sound is okay. You can hear me well in the lecture hall? Yes? Okay. I, I put it to the max here because I know that uh, in previous instances it wasn't loud enough, but normally that should be okay. All right, so let's continue then. Um, so we've seen that uh, Hadoop is on a centralized architecture with the name nodes and the data nodes. And what we are going to do next is to go into the details of that. So the implementation of uh, Hadoop is all done in Java. That would be the, the native language uh, of uh, HDFS, the same for MapReduce and so on. Uh, but of course, there's APIs that allow you to access it from many other uh, languages. Um, OK. Now, as promised, let's dive more into the details. And we are going to start with the name node. And this includes actually an answer to the question that uh, one of you asked earlier about what there is on a name node. So let's look into what there is. What do you think there is on a name node? Yes? Maybe the, the catch box, uh, where is it? Yeah, because this is the correct answer. Uh, does it work? Yes. So probably mappings from blocks to each data node so that we know which data nodes contain what blocks? This is correct. There is indeed a mapping from the block IDs, so they're identified with IDs, from the block IDs to the data nodes where they are located. This is on the name nodes. Anything else? Yes? Um, does it perform some kind of load balancing? So it would have information about which node has how many requests? Yes, indeed. So this actually is a consequence of what you said, right? Because you know exactly where the blocks are located. And indeed, the responsibility of the name node is to load balance a little bit, right? So this is indeed what it has to do. Um, now we are trying to find out what is stored. So basically what information is in the memory of the da data node. Can you make a guess maybe of something that you think in addition to the mapping from the block IDs uh, to, the, to the data node? Well, I thought in order to like load balance, it would have to store information on like where it sent previous requests, but if it just does it randomly, then it will be load balanced. So I guess not. Um, maybe let me try to, to, uh, to give a clue. Um, imagine that the only thing that you store on the name node would be this mapping from each block ID to the data nodes. Do you have enough? to give me the content of an entire file. If I ask you for slash home slash Hadoop slash file.txt, can you give that to me with only that mapping? Or can you imagine what could be missing? Well, if each block stores a pointer to the next block of that file, then yes. Yes, exactly. This is getting close to it. So indeed, you need this, you know what we saw earlier, It was yes here. You need to re to be able to replay the blocks that belong to the same file. Otherwise, it's just a random list of blocks that are stored in the cluster. You need to know that if you have a file, this is its first block, this is the second block, and so on. So you suggested that's actually an idea. It could be a linked list, right? That every block points to the next one. In fact, it's not done that way. It's done as a metadata on the name node that the name node keeps the sequence of the block IDs that belong to the same file. So this is also something that there is on the, on the name node. Any other idea? Anybody else? Yes? File hierarchy? Yes, absolutely. The hierarchy of directories and files, you also need that in order to locate the files. So if we go back to where we are, here we are. So we have the file namespace. This is what you just said. The file to block mapping, so every file is associated with a list of blocks, and the block locations, which maps the block IDs to the data nodes on, on which we are. Right? So these are the three things that the name node, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> these are the three things that the name node actually has in its memory. And if you think about it, everything you have here is enough to bring the service, to basically give. The, the data to people who are accessing HDFS. Okay. Um, 
Okay, now let's go to the data node. So actually it's almost boring uh, what there is on the data node because this is just plenty of blocks, right? So these blocks are actually local files on every data node. These are local files. You can actually, you can try later if you actually want to experiment around, if you create an AGFS cluster, you can actually try to log into one of the data nodes and look on the file system and try to find the block files. These are files. Uh, a question during the, bre the break that was asked that is very actually important is if the last block, so all the blocks are going to be 128 megabytes, but the last block might be less, right? In fact, most of the time it will be less. There is no waste of space, right? So the last block will really take up just the space that it needs. If it's two megabytes and it's just a two megabyte file on the local file system of the data node. What's really important to understand, and here it's something that as a computer scientist, I'm sure you will have no difficulty doing, is that from the perspective of HDFS, which is a file system, there's all these very large files and data sets accessible uh, via the name node and, uh, uh, you know, cut into blocks that are on the data nodes. But if you zoom in on a data node and look inside, you will see that the blocks are in fact on the local file system. So do not confuse the local file system of every data node with the HDFS file system, right? It's very important to understand that these are two levels, two physical levels of things, all right? So these are files. Um, what we also check, uh, sorry, store with each block is a checksum. We also store along some, uh, some checksum in order to check if the file goes corrupt. And uh, we check once in a while, so the client always recomputes the checksum and uh, will inform the name node if there is any issue. Okay. The data nodes can detect their own failure, so they will notice if, for example, they might have multiple drives. So if one drive crashes, then this can be reported. We'll see how, but this can be reported to the name node as a disk failure of which we will recover. The block IDs, I haven't said anything about that. It's just 64 bit um, sequences, right? It's just, uh, uh, you, you can consider it integers on 64 bits, basically. These are the block IDs. Okay. Something that here, I'm very cautious when I'm saying that because um, that might sound counterintuitive when I said we don't have random access. Nevertheless, we can still access within a block a sub part of a block, not the entire block, but we can just request to, re to, to read uh, a certain interval of the block. But do not make the mistake of thinking that gives you random access. Because again, you of course you have random access, you can access anywhere, but the question is how fast can you get that? This is still slow. The main reason for that, we will see that it's because of MapReduce, uh, but we'll see uh, in a few weeks why this is actually useful to be able to read just uh, uh, part of a block and not the entire block. Okay, so this is what there is, I'll come to you. This is what there is on the name nodes. This is what there is on the data nodes. And the next step is to communicate between the, the nodes on the cluster in order to figure out how the thing is orchestrated. Yes, maybe the, the catch box, it's over there. So I was wanting to ask, let's say uh, you want to upload like a folder with a bunch of files in it, but they don't, let's say, uh, total up to less uh, more than 128 megabytes. Do we still get like a different blocks for each of the files inside the folder? Or just uh, collect them in one block? Yeah. So in order to answer this question, it's interesting to, um, to think about what's actually gonna happen when you do that. When you, so, so let's say you're sitting on your laptop and this is actually as a data scientist, you will have to do these things, right? You want to upload uh, the contents of a folder to the, um, to the cluster. So first, what's going to happen um, is that you have some software on your laptop, some sort of clients of HDFS. Uh, typically, you can have a Java API actually that does that. It's actually, it fits into the Java way of doing IO stuff, right? With these uh, input streams and output streams and so on. So basically, you have this local library in Java that's going to take care of uploading and downloading, in fact, as if it were local. From an API perspective, it doesn't really make a difference that it's local. You, you will see it's slower, of course, um, but it's, it works in the same way. Now, if you try to do that, let's say in a naive way, you try to use this API and say, okay, I'm gonna upload these files and folders. Probably 
this will just be an iteration on the file and that file by file, you upload them directory by directory, you run an MKD. We will actually see it's an MKD also in LGFS. So you create the directories. But the consequence of that is that it's going to create every for every file, you will create a new block. So if all the files are less than 120 megabytes, then you will have just one block per file. What HDFS though will not do is group it together in a single block, that it will not do. However, as a user, you can still build some form of archive file, you know? It's something that if some of you played around with, you know, and you need to upload to a server, if you put it in a single file, it's a single upload. You can even compress it if you want, right? But basically, if you just, do not put it in the same archive and output the entire hierarchy, one block for every file, right? Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, this is more of a curiosity question, but thinking about the fact that here we are making use of more machines to sort of handle the fact that well, storage is uh, unfortunately going to fail sometime. I know that this also came with the cost, but I was wondering what would have been the cost if we rather focused on perfecting the storage such that it doesn't fail, or is that not even feasible? So indeed you could perfect the storage. In fact, there are technologies for that. For example, uh, RAID, right? Re uh, redundant array of inexpen inexpensive disks, right? Who knows RAID? I never used it, but I know it exists. So RAID is a technology like that, that you can just put several drives uh, uh, locally on, on your computer. And then you have many ways of making it work. Either you can have mirrors, so every drive is the same as the others and you just replicate. You have other ways of just distributing the, the bits to read in parallel over the machines. So you have things like that. Um, this sort of technology is designed to just be local on a single machine, right? So it's, it's just running on your computer. You will not scale to, uh, to, to a cluster. Um, when you design a system like HDFS, in fact, you do not need RAID. So you do not need anymore to worry about making each drive uh, not crash, basically. You, you, you just let the drives crash. Uh, I, I, would, I would say in the design, the, the, the mindset is, it's just simpler to let the drives crash than to try to come up with something even more complex by buying even more drives that would be just more expensive and more waste to do it that way, right? So that, that, that's the mindset. Does it make sense? Any other questions? Yeah, there's one from yeah. Zoom. Is name node the only responsible for checksum validation for blocks? There are no validation on data nodes and also fidelity of data during read write can be affected of at data nodes. Um, can we put, let, let me explain the communication because then we can address this question yeah. because then you will understand. If I explain to you how they communicate with each other, I think a lot of these things will be easier to explain. So let me go through the communication. Th this is the complex stuff, right? So this is the whole overview with how all of these people communicate together. Um, but let's do it one by one. So first, um, there is the clients that is whoever is using HDFS communicating with the name node. All of that is the high level metadata thing. Create a directory, delete a directory, delete a file, and so on. You can also ask to create a new file. This is all with the name node. If you want to read a file, the name node will give you the block IDs and their locations, right? When it gives you, in fact, the block IDs and the locations of the blocks, it will be kind enough to sort them by distance to you, right? By uh, increasing distance, right? And again, what's important to understand is that the clients that you see right here, very often is one of the machines on the cluster. It's actually the same machine as one of the data nodes. If you use precise term, what is name node and data node? It's not the machines, it's a process running on the machine. That's the best way to understand them. So you have plenty of machines. On one of the machines, you have a name node process. On the other machines, you have a data node process, but you can have other processes running on the same machine, right? And so one of these processes running on the same machine as the data node process could be the client. You can also have a client outside of the cluster, it's just slower, but you can also connect from your laptop into an HDFS cluster. Okay, but if you're in the cluster, then there's a notion of distance and it's nicely sorted, okay. So this is the protocol, the client protocol. It's using uh, uh, remote procedure calls, RPCs, for those who know. 
Um, let's now look at the communication between name nodes and data nodes. It's simpler than it seems. What happens is that the data nodes connect periodically to the name node. And it is only in that direction, never the other one. The, the name node is never going to connect, to initiate a connection with the name node. So basically, it means that the data node, if, if you use the client server terminology, right? A client connects to a server. Uh, it is the name node that acts as a server and the data node that acts as a client. So the data node connects to the name node. But of course, once the data node connects to the name node, they communicate with each other. So of course, the name node can also reply with instructions and so on, but it will only do that within a connection of the, of the data node. Now, what are these connections? Uh, first, there is a connection when a new data node arrives, joins the cluster. It's a new machine that maybe the sysadmins have just added. And the data node is going to register with the, data, the name node and saying, hey, I'm here. I'm free. I have plenty of free space and I'm joining the HDFS cluster as a new data node. Right. And maybe as an answer, the uh, name node is going to instruct it to download a couple of blocks to increase uh, uh, replication and maybe load balance a bit. Right. So this is the registration. The second thing, the second reason why the data node would connect to the name node is what's called the heartbeat. This is part of the fault tolerance thing. Every couple of seconds, typically every three seconds, but you can change that, every three seconds, the data node is going to give a sign of life to the name node. Like, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here, right? So every three seconds. And all of these heart heartbeats are an opportunity for the name node to send instructions. So that's actually why the name node never initiates a connection. It doesn't need two, it just needs to wait for three seconds for the next heartbeat and then answer to the heartbeat, right? Or, or not answer anything, which is fine too. The next thing is the block report. The block report is rarer because it's actually heavier. It's a full blown report of everything. So the, the, the data node is saying the full list of all the blocks that it's holding with the checksums and everything. Uh, so that the name node has the full overview of what's, what is on the cluster, okay? So this is the block report. And uh, finally, the data node can also send some acknowledgements that they have received the block. We'll also see in what context this is on. So these are the four reasons why a data node can connect to the name node. And again, the main message here is it is always the data node that initiates the connection, never the other way around. Any questions? Yes? We'll see very shortly the answer, the answer to this. The, the client, in fact, directly connects to the data nodes is the short answer. And in fact, oh, here it is. So, so you see, that's exactly the transition to the next one. So let, let's talk about this then. So what happens is that when you want to actually send or upload the blocks to the cluster, the client is initiating to uh, the, the connection to a name node and he's going to send over the actual blocks, the actual bits. So what's important is that this is not sent to the name node. It doesn't even go through the name node. But remember that this is why we know which data node to connect to, because the name node told us. So the client knows from the name node that it is expected to connect to a specific data node, and then it connects to the data node. I'll also have recap slides a bit later. So the data nodes are sent, the data blocks, so we are sent to the data node like that. And in fact, the way that this is done is for the replication, you need three replicas, right? The client will not connect to three data nodes. Rather, it will connect to just one, and then you just chain them, you create a pipeline. So you have the first data node that is going to ship over after making a copy, the block to the next data node, and then again, shipping over to the next one. It's a chain of data nodes. That's called the replication pipeline. This is only for write, writing. So this is the summary of everything. So you see that most of the connections here would be called control, right? It's just communication to, uh, to control. The actual data would be shipped between the client and the data node. I probably also should have put data here because you can also 
uh, ship data between the data nodes, right? I should add it. But this is the idea. This is the overview. Yes? This is all communicated by the client. So basically, we will have again a slide on that. The client receives three data node addresses that it's supposed to ship a block to. It's going to ship with the block also the locations of the other data nodes so that this data node knows which ones they are. They are. Okay. Other questions? Yes? Just sorry, can, can you use the microphone? Oh, yes. Otherwise, no zoom date. Uh, and similarly, when uh, the client wants to receive some data, does it only connect to the block or the, the data node with the first block yep. and the rest follow, or does it connect iteratively to like all, all data nodes? It will connect to the first one. It will only connect to the other ones if it fails. I imagine that the first one, for example, just crashes. Then the client is just going to check with the next one. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, what does this implicate like in terms of security? Do we fully trust the client in that case, right? Because you could just send like send it to every other data node and then we yep. could pollute the system or whatever. So this is a good question. What is important to understand, I would say two things. Um, the first thing is that when you have an HDFS cluster, it's not the Ethereum blockchain or Bitcoin, right? It's not a system that is fully resilient uh, against attacks. This here is all within your cluster. It, it's your own machines. This is one company who has full control of the cluster, right? And as a company, you have controls of all, of all the machines, right? So of course, there's a few in the protocol, you have a few, um, uh, uh, a few protocols in place that the data nodes can authenticate to the, to the name node and so on, right? In order to, to check that they are from the cluster. But basically, you, you, you wouldn't need the same level of security as you have in the full worldwide uh, object storage. Um, the second thing is that you nevertheless have access control lists in the, in the system, right? So you can, it's a POSIX like, it's similar to the local file system. You can actually assign user names uh, to, the, uh, to, the, um, uh, to all the machines in there. So there, there is some form of authentication and, and security. I'm also not an expert in security, so I know that I'm not giving you probably a, as a detailed answer as an information security specialist would, uh, but this is just on a high level how I would describe it, right? That, does it answer your question? Yes? Okay. Yes. Okay. Let me continue then. Okay. So this is, yeah, that's just yet another way. So these are the names of the protocols. So now the metadata that you do on a name node, you can create a directory, delete, write a file, append to a file, read a file, delete a file, and so on and so on. Right? This is all you can do. Okay, now I have these animations. It's just in order to, uh, to show you everything that's going on in the, uh, in the cluster when you actually do read or write a file. So let's start with reading because it's a bit easier. So this is the client. It could be in the data center, outside the data center. It wants to, to ask for a file in order to read it. So what it does is that it connects to the name node, right? Always first connect to the name node. The name node is going to answer. Uh, it could answer that the file doesn't exist, but it could also answer that the file does exist. And if that's the case, it's going to, uh, to give the, uh, the, the, the blocks of the files, their IDs, their locations, multiple data nodes for each block, three potentially data nodes for each block, sorted by distance, meaning the first one is the closer one and, and so on and so on, right? So then the clients has all it needs to then connect to the data nodes. Here's now a small tricky thing, but it's something I kind of already explained earlier. On the physical level, on the network level, what happens is that the client as a machine is going to connect to data nodes, plenty of them, because for each block, you need to connect to another data node. So the machine is going to initiate collections all over the place in the cluster in order to download the blocks. Um, now, the pattern in which the blocks are downloaded depends on the use case, because there's many possible things you could be doing in your cluster. One of the things you could be doing is you are, as a user, sitting on your laptop and you're just downloading a file. 
it's small enough that you can download it. So you just want to download a file that might be, I don't know, 10 blocks, and you want to download it to your machine. Um, another use case could be you are using MapReduce. In MapReduce, as we will see, the reads are in parallel. We just connect to the blocks all over the cluster, and this is a totally different pattern, but this is not one we'll uh, cover today. If we go back to the pattern of you downloading an HGFS file to your local laptop, you typically will do that over the shell. So you have an HGFS shell, as we will see, and you put the command to download. What's going to happen is that this shell is probably implemented in Java. In Java, there is this, uh, uh, this uh, input stream that is the API for IO in Java. And what happens is that this API contains an implementation dedicated to HDFS, and the API will deal with all the complexity of connected to the data nodes. So for the user, it just feels like the file is incoming and being downloaded. What's going on is that the input stream is intelligently connected to all the data nodes. So if you do it block by block, let's do it sequentially. Then you look at the first block, connect to the first data node in the list. If it works, you connect to the data nodes, download the block, and you're done. And then you go to the next uh, block, right? If the first data node of a block fails, you just try the second one, right? If it fails, you try the, the third one. And then if it fails, then you have a problem. And, uh, and uh, that's actually the whole thing fails. Um, what this also does is that the client, whenever it downloads a block, also gets the checksum from the data node. And it is expected that the client checks that checksum to make sure that the block is not corrupt. And the client is expected, in case of a problem with the checksum, to report it to the name node. Right? Then the name node will deal with it. OK, but let's come back here. This input stream here initiates the connections. From above, the input stream will just send the steady sequence of bits. Right? All the way, maybe a whole terabyte worth of bits will just be output there. And all the connection here is just switched between. OK? Is this clear? For whom is that clear? OK. So yes, a question? Yeah. yeah. Just one question. I was wondering, uh, you mentioned that we do this sequentially, but couldn't we parallelize the read? If yes, you can. Or the block locations? Yeah. So this is why I mentioned that there are patterns in the way you do things. Uh, sequentially is an easy way to use it. Sequentially just means you, you go block by block. Um, you could, of course, decide to parallelize. Maybe you have 10 blocks to download. So you might think, okay, I'm going to download, I don't know, two or three blocks at a time, right? And do it in parallel. But then the question to ask yourself is, will it actually be faster if you do it in parallel? And here it depends on a few things. For example, imagine that your connection to the data node is already your top internet speed, that, that you're already fully using your bandwidth. Then if you connect to two data nodes in parallel, it's not going to be faster because each one is just going to be twice as long and then you'll have your two blocks at the end, right? So the answer is really depends. But if your bandwidth to a single data node is less than your overall bandwidth, then of course, uh, downloading in parallel is going to help. Uh, in fact, this is typically the case, and uh, here I'm going to take the example of S3 because it's a bit similar. If you try to connect to the S3 interface in a browser, you can also upload file, files in there. And all you do is drag and drop the file to the, to the website, and then it starts uploading the file. But the way that it will do it, will vary. if you have plenty of files, it will do it in parallel. Not enormously in parallel, it's not like it's not going to do 100 files in parallel, but maybe two or three or four or five, maybe up to eight, right? Does it answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. So let's go into writing files now. So if we write a file, as always, we communicate first with the name node, so we create the file. And then the name node is going to acknowledge that a file is to be created. So it updates the namespace and so on. And then says, OK, this is your first block. This is the idea of the block. And these are the data nodes that I would like you to upload this block to. Right? There is no block data in there. The client doesn't even send any block data there. We've said it before. Instead, the client connects to the first data node. And it's going to, uh, so it also contains the list of data nodes. And then you have this pipeline that is established. 
if you want to formally explain how the pipeline is done, uh, it's not just by increasing distance, it's more subtle than that. It is optimized so that the sum of all the distances in a straight line, because that's a pipeline, the total distance must be as small as possible. This is how it's optimized, right? So then it ships the data over. So once it has organized the pipeline, it ships the data over. Now, what does it mean to ship the data? It means to ship the block. The block is 128 megabytes worth of data, all right? But actually, uh, uh, then you have an hack, but this is actually how a more physical way that it is done, because now we are on the network. We are shipping stuff on the network. So this is very low level. This is almost, uh, uh, you know, be below HDFS. What's gonna happen in fact, is that this block of 128 megabytes is going to be cut further into smaller pieces of 64 kilobytes. And these pieces are sent over the network and you do not even wait for the hack every time. You just ship them over and then, you know, asynchronously wait for the acknowledgement that this had been received. And when you have all the acknowledgements at the end, then you are going to close the connection. Right, so these are all of the parts of the blocks, but this is not part of the HDFS model. This is low level, but these together will make up your block of 128 megabytes, right? Then at the end, you close the connection, okay? And then you just do it over and over and over and over again. That's the second block. You get again a block ID, you get again the data nodes, and then you, uh, you ship it over, you organize the pipeline, and so on and so on. You send uh, the block over, you acknowledge and so on, right? So you just iterate and iterate and do it for every block, right? And at the end, you close and release the lock. What's gonna happen next is that the name node is going to check for minimal replication, meaning that you have minimally replicated each block and then acknowledge. But here I have one more thing to say because that might be confusing. Why do we check minimal replication? Because anyway, we pipeline the whole thing to target three name data nodes, right? So uh, why do we need to check anything? What in fact happens is that while you are actually pipelining your, pipelining your block through, it might be that some of the data nodes are going to fail or that something is going to go wrong. Maybe that you're writing here to three, maybe only two of them are actually going to end up with the block or maybe just one of them, right? So maybe not all of the three. Um, in that case, there is a bit of um, leniency in the protocol is that by default, if one or even two of the data nodes do not successfully store a copy of the block and only one, then it just still continues, right? So we just have a replication of one for the moment and uh, it just continues all the way to the end. And here, what the name node is doing is that it just checks for this minimal replication of one, that at least one replica of each block is in the cluster, at least for now. Um, this is this, uh, in the communication protocol, the, the block received uh, thing that I showed you. But now, after, so then it sends the hack. What's important to understand is this is synchronous, right? So here, you close or release the lock and you wait for the acknowledgement. You're blocked on that call, right? So during that block, uh, that synchronous call, you check for minimal replication and then acknowledge, right? And then people can read uh, in the cluster. And then asynchronously, because now we are after the acknowledgement, asynchronously, the name node is going to then replicate the blocks further if needed. So for example, if it notices that for some of the blocks, there are only one or two replicas, then the name node is going to wait for the next heartbeat of the data node. And it's just going to instruct them to send over or download over the blocks to create replicas. Yes? I have a question. Wasn't the block report done every six hours for a very long period of time? So then how does it, how does the client wait just a short amount of time so that the, the, the name node will check that the actual replica is there? As in, because the, the node will never instruct will never instruct the data node to send that information, right? So I have my thinking is this: um, the report is sent at least every six hours, but you can still request one, right? But in that case, uh, I don't think it's needed because you have this block received thing, 
right? So it's possible for a data node to just say, say to the name node, I have that block, you know, with the checksum and so on. So, so you don't need to wait for six hours for the next report because this is actually a question that was asked every year. It took us a while to figure it out, right? Because it's not very well documented. But basically the issue is here that do you need to wait for six hours in a synchronous call? That's awful, of course. You don't want to, to wait for six hours in a synchronous call. And this is the reason why here you, you are not actually waiting for the block reports. You are really just uh, uh, waiting for the block received and then the rest is asynchronous. And in fact, this asynchronous thing, it happens all the time. If, even later, without anything or any activity from the clients, data nodes will crash. Blocks will get corrupted. So the name node is just constantly checking, double checking the checksums and constantly ensuring replication and so on. Right? Okay. We're actually making good progress because we still have eight minutes to go and we actually did a very large part of the lecture already. So maybe tomorrow uh, is going to be even a bit of a shorter lecture. All right. So let's talk a bit about the replicas. Um, the default is three. So I told you, you can have by default three replicas of each block. You can change that. You can make it one if you don't care. You can make it five or 10 if you really care about the file. It is per file. It doesn't have to be the same for all the cluster. You can change it per file. Right. Um, now, how do you distribute the blocks is an open question, right? I just told you the name node tells you which data nodes to write to, but you don't know which ones. Um, so there are a few considerations for this. And this is my opportunity to tell you now about the distance between the, uh, the nodes that we, because we said it started by distance. Do you remember the, the everything I explained to you on the data center, the, the way that it's organized? We basically pile up the servers on top of each other in what we call racks. And then you have rooms in data centers that are filled with racks, right? Um, so you can actually build some kind of topology of the data center. The topology is basically all the network cables between the machines, right? So you have the cluster, and then it's made of plenty of racks, and then the racks contain nodes. So you do have some sort of hierarchy between the nodes. And in particular, you can see that when two nodes are in the same rack, they are closer to each other than, for example, two nodes that are on different racks. So you have a notion of distance. You could, for example, define it as the number of uh, uh, edges in any direction on the shortest path between the two nodes. So here it's a distance of two, and here, it's a distance of four, right? So now that we have a distance, um, this is what allows us or allows the name nodes to specify the order in which to read the data nodes. But it's not just the distance. It's also the awareness that nodes can or cannot be on the same rack that will influence the replica placement. So, here, I, I'm just throwing the uh, solution at your, uh, how, how the replicas are, uh, are uh, uh, stored at every request. So every time you need to store a block. The first replica of a block is stored on the same machine as the client. But now you might be wondering what? The same machine as the client, but the machine is a, a data node, right? But no, that's what I said, that very often the machine of the client is one of the nodes in a cluster. In MapReduce, we'll see that's going to be the case. In fact, every single one of the data nodes is a client in MapReduce. So this is why when we say same node as the client, this is really like on the same machine as the data node process. So the first replica is put on the same node, right? So it's going, it's going to be a local uh, write, actually. Um, the second replica is going to be a node in a different track, right? So if we were here, for example, and this is my client. So I put one replica here and the next replica I put here on a different rack. The third replica is going to be on another node in the same other rack, right? So it means if I had here, I'm my client, the second and third replicas are here. And then if there's more than three, if you increase the default, you'll just continue to spread the, uh, the, uh, the replicas all over the cluster, but you have two constraints. The first one is that there is no point storing more than once a block on the same node. 
there's no point in storing it twice. If the node crashes, the node crashes, right? So that's the first rule. The second rule is you don't need to put in the same rack the same block more than twice. So two replicas per rack is enough, right? So these are the ground rules. All right. We still have time to explain the subtlety. Maybe I can stop here and take it from there tomorrow in explaining, because now that's actually the open question for tonight. Why here do we store replicas two and three on a different rack? And why don't we just put the second one on the same rack as rack A? So let me put that as an open question, think about it, and tomorrow we'll take it from there. Before you go, there is a question on Zoom that we will also um, uh, address. Don't go just yet. So let's answer the question on Zoom while you are answering to this. So the question is what happens if data nodes are not responding with a heartbeat for a while and after what time span time span or absent heartbeat the data node is considered as that so that's part of the fail fault tolerance protocol so the whole point of the heartbeats is that the name node knows which data nodes are still there so obviously if the the name node has not heard of a given data node for a while then it's going to declare it as uh, as gone right uh, I don't know by heart how much time it would wait by default. Maybe we can we can look at it offline. Uh, can be a minute, five minutes, ten minutes, an hour. You know, because since you have replicas, you can wait for an hour. It's not such a big deal, right? All right. Let's just see here how you understood. So this is perfect, more than eighty percent. So I keep the same speed. Thank you very much, and uh, see you tomorrow in the main building for the continuation. Bye.